Uh, good afternoon. Hi, my name is Jason Lipfeld, and this is uh, the Hosto Student Leadership Academy Annual Winter Workshop Series. This is year number 16, and we're celebrating 2024. So I'm glad that you could join us here today. Uh, we're very excited to have students from across the CUNY campuses. Uh, it's been great. The, the first three workshops have been extraordinary, and the participation has been uh, insanely good. And, and we, we look to continue on uh, mission, uh, as we call it, uh, with this workshop. But today, I have to say, this afternoon, you get a treat. All the way from Arizona, um, one, of, one of my most distinguished colleagues, one of my favorite people to work with, um, we met a long time ago at a conference. It's such a long time ago now. Um, but she was willing when she was in the area, whether it was New York or Boston, to come and visit with us. And because we have, you know, this um, the, the use of technology to do the workshops this year, because she's in Arizona, she's able to be with us today. And I tell you that I've heard this workshop before, but every time I hear this workshop, every time I sit through this workshop, I am uh, moved uh, to make change in my life. I, I I think about things in a different way. And so I guarantee you, you are going to have a great experience uh, this afternoon. And I want to thank you again for being here. So I present to you the incredible, uh, the talented, uh, the, the person who, when you go to Arizona, you have to meet, uh, Dr. Christina Marine. Thank you so much, Jason, my good friend. Um, <clears throat> I wish I could, you know, be in the Bronx with all of you at this moment um, or anywhere in New York. But, you know, since you're all almost all underwater right now, I would rather be here. Um, it's not very warm here today, but it is sunny. Um, I'm in my office, though, so um, you get this kind of view. Uh, I have uh, recently added, I'm going to try and show you all, to my office, um, these shades on my fluorescent lights, can you see that? That are actually fall foliage trees because being in Arizona, I try and when I put those lights on, I wanna see some kind of seasons. So that's helped me a lot just sort of emotionally when I need some light and some ideas of seasons. And I grew up in Queens. Um, and so New York is always, will always be home to me. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of a background on myself, um, so that you have an understanding of, of who I am and why, um, Jason believes I should be in this room with you all. But I, um, have a degree in theater from Northwestern University, first and foremost, um, in acting and directing. But when I went to graduate school and I was introduced to the work of Augusto Boal from Brazil and Paulo Freire, also from Brazil, I became an educator who understood the power of using theater as an educational tool to discuss um, different issues, topics that concern us in community. And that's how Jason and I met. We were at a workshop, a, a conference, and I did a workshop using theater. And the group from um, CUNY, from Hostos in particular, came up to me and said, we need to bring you to our school. And so I started to go. And there are some pretty amazing photos of um, some alums from the Student Leadership Academy of us doing some physical hands-on work um, using theater techniques. Now, when we went into sort of lockdown with COVID and we all started to discover this idea of you could do workshops with anyone anywhere in the world um, if you can make things happen sort of on your computer. So we're not going to necessarily do the kind of theater games and stuff that um, that I'm used to doing in these kinds of workshops. But there is one exercise that we'll do a little bit later on. And I, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to have Jason be the um, the person who's going to do the exercise with me. So I'm going to make sure that Jason has three objects. How about three pens? Do you have three pens with you, Jason? A highlighter. I love it. Let me get a highlighter. <laughs> Let's see. I have a highlighter too. What else do you got? 
Wait, I can't see it. In this, there we go. Okay, so we'll do, I'm going to do a pink pen and I'm going to do a Sharpie. So these three things, perfect. I love it. These three things we're going to use later on in the workshop. We'll put those aside. Uh, because I do like the idea of us having an interactive element, even though we are, you know, close to 2,000 miles apart. Um, so my PhD is uh, in theater uh, with a concentration in theater for young audiences. And what I did as my research was I looked at using theater for social change or theater of the oppressed as a tool to unpack um ideas about identity construction with um, Latina adolescent girls, um, which also brought in, you know, young um, Latinos as well, because we, you know, we don't form identity in a vacuum. Um, as I went, so after I did my PhD, I went to work at NYU, which is how Jason and I um, got to meet. And then I worked in Boston at Emerson College. And during my time at NYU and Emerson, I started to focus on human rights education through theater. And in doing human rights education, I started to be introduced to the work of some people like um, Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. Um, I was introduced to the work of um, Don Miguel Ruiz, who will specifically look at his writing today. Um, and these frameworks. And then when I came back to Arizona, I met a man, a professor um, at the first school that I worked at here in Arizona. Uh, and his name is Dr. Steve Ornelis. And Dr. Ornelis wrote a book called Energy Vampires. So the two frameworks that we're gonna be using today um, are the four agreements and the energy vampires framework um, a little bit. So let me go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen and see uh, if I can, let's see, if I do this and then you can see this thing, but then I wanna do the slideshow. So can you all see that as a full screen? Perfect. So one yes. of the that I, thank you. One of the things that I wanna make sure is I'm gonna open the chat and I'm going to try and keep an eye on it. Jason's going to keep an eye on it. He's going to continue to let people in. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being in this space with us when the weather is not so great there. Like, you know, there's alerts and, and stuff. And please, whatever you need to do to keep yourself safe and, um, you know, just be here with us, but, but be safe. Um, so I guess that's my introduction. And I just want to put a pin in that. Um, and ask if anyone has any questions first, if they, you know, need any clarification about anything I've just said. Awesome. Um, then what I would like to see, um, if you could see, I can go all the way down to there. Okay. Um, if you could in the chat, so open up the chat and can you just say either yes or no? There are some yeses here already, but that's to a different question. But yes or no, of if you have ever read the book called The Four Agreements. With a lot of no's. Uh, some sections of it. Thanks, Melissa. And you haven't heard about it, Emily. Okay. So, um, Dynma says briefly, excellent. So we get a lot of, so, so most people have not been introduced to this work, which is helpful to me to be able to be the first person to give it to you as a gift. Um, the four agreements, as Jason said, has like changed the way he walks in the world. It changed the way I walk in the world by thinking about how these things impact us and how we can make change in our own way that we, walk in the world, um, we affect other people's lives. The impact we have on other people is strong as well. Um, and Energy Vampires, I'm pretty sure if you've heard of it, it's been in a different framework than my friend Steve Ornelas's framework. So I'm not gonna worry about that. But um, what I am gonna do is start off by giving you a little bit of an idea. Let me see how to, there we go. So. 
the four agreements, this is the cover of the book and it comes from um, Toltec wisdom. So the Toltecs, right? If you've heard of like the Aztecs, the Mayans, there are also dynasties of, you know, this ancestry line of like the Chichimecas, the Olmecs, and the Toltecs are one um, dynasty of this, of this uh, part of the world, right? That we're in the Americas um, and the Southern part of this continent, which many people in Latin America call the Americas instead of just North America and South America or North Central and South, just because you cut a hole through the middle of it doesn't make it two continents. It's still one, it's still the Americas. So um, many of our counterparts in, in Latin America, that's what they learn in fifth grade. When we're learning there are seven continents, they learn that there are five or six. Um, so Don Miguel Ruiz um, is himself what is called a Nahual from the Eagle Knight lineage. So he's a teacher. He's an, a knowledgeable um, ancestor in this work. And this book that he's created is a practical guide to personal freedom. And freedom from what? Freedom from, you know, so much of what we consider like the stressors, the anxiety and the pressures of our everyday life. So this is a book that you can pick up on Amazon for less than $10. Um, paperback that like literally you can read. And one of the things that I want to talk to Jason about is potentially um, getting some money from the CUNY system to have uh, a couple of copies in the um, SLA uh, space to have people be able to come in and kind of read through um, so that you have some in the library. Um, okay, let me go back here. So Thousands of years ago, the Toltec were known throughout Southern Mexico as women and men of knowledge. The Toltec were scientists and artists who formed a society to explore and conserve the spiritual knowledge and the practices of the ancient ones. They came together as masters, or again, the word Nahual, and students at Teotihuacan, which is the ancient city of pyramids outside Mexico City, known as the place where man becomes God. And this is one of the pyramids. They've actually closed off access to foot traffic onto many of the pyramids in Teotihuacan, I think two or three of them, um, because of the erosion that like just human contact has been um, taking its toll on the, um, on the pyramids themselves. So, we go to, so Toltec knowledge is another angle or view of that pyramid in Mexico. Toltec knowledge arises from the same essential unity of truth as all the sacred esoteric traditions from around the world. One of the things that I like to do, you can see that this is highlighted uh, in blue and there's a link to it because, you know, we might not all know what the word esoteric means. So I have a link to what the, the, um, Dictionary says, understood or meant by only a select few who have special knowledge or interest. Um, recondite is another word that we could probably look up the definition for, but um, so are we back to the Yes. Slide? Okay, perfect. So it's these esoteric traditions, right, that maybe only certain people study or only certain people believe in, but many of them across the traditions of the world find these essential truths to be center to their core. It is not a religion. So I don't want anyone in this space to think like, I'm not gonna believe in your religion. You're like a weird woman from Arizona. Um, I'm not preaching a religion. Um, it honors all of the spiritual masters who've ever taught on the earth, including everyone who is, you know, from Muhammad to um, Moses to Jesus to um, uh, like everyone, the Buddha, um, everyone who has ever preached the idea of um, religious fellowship and brotherhood, this is what this honors, right? While it does embrace spirit or the idea that we have um, a spirit that works within us, it's most accurately described 
as a way of life distinguished by the ready accessibility of happiness and love. And I hate to ask this question, but so go ahead and, and raise your hand if you don't want happiness and love. Oh, good. No hands. Let's move on. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started with what these agreements are. There are four of them. There is a new book written by um, Don Miguel Ruiz's son that is um, called The Fifth Agreement, but we won't go into that. If you're interested in that, you can you know pick up that book. But this idea is be impeccable with your word. Now, that seems strange, right? I've underlined this word too. Let's go ahead and check out what this means. Faultless, flawless, irreproachable, not liable to sin or to talk against someone else or yourself and incapable of sin. Great, we're going back to the presentation, impeccable, be flawless with your word. Now that could mean a lot of things, right? So this is what Don Miguel Ruiz interprets this agreement with ourselves to mean. Speak with integrity. Say only what you mean. Avoid using the word to speak against yourself or to gossip about others. Use the power of your word in the direction of truth and love. Now, I can't see everyone, but I'm gonna open this up. So I don't see anyone except me and Jason, but if you are interested in sharing anything in terms of like, have you ever experienced a situation where someone or even yourself right sometimes it's hardest to admit things that we've done ourselves but where you've used your word in a way that has caused other people to suffer to have pain right or if someone has used the word to cause you pain anyone who wants to share can unmute themselves you don't have to take your you don't have to put your camera on but you can um and if you want to tell a story or type something in the chat Emily, go ahead. Hi, everyone. So my name is Emily, and I am a SLA student ambassador. And I wanted to talk about uh, this time that I got, you know, it was just about lacking empathy. So basically, I have met this person who I didn't really kind of get along with. And it kind of bombarded my, I guess, my correct opinion or my more human opinion and I just I kind of kept judging it was like a really a really like very problematic situation where I could have been a little nicer so it was one time where I did kind of realize that you know words cut a little deeper than I expected and it's about having more empathy than having any mixed opinion about anybody I love that you bring that word empathy into this I think it's one of the key factors about the agreements. And I don't know that in the, all the times that we've been doing this workshop, um, Jason, anyone's made that connection. So Emily, again, Jason and I continue to deepen our knowledge about all of this. So thank you. And Angela's in the chat, right? Yeah, which is something I try not to do since I know how much words can hurt, right? Words can cut deep. And sometimes, it, you know, there's there's some some of the moments where we're like being judgy and not feeling, you know, as empathic as we can. Um, and we say things. I literally, and and so I want to make sure that you know that I walk in this world as a human being, right? I make mistakes. I go against the agreements sometimes. Right before I came in to do this workshop, I sent a text to a colleague and very dear friend of mine. She is applying for a job at the community college here in Arizona that she has worked at for eight years. And they've been grooming her to go into a full-time faculty position. And yet, now that they have that faculty line, they've written the job posting in a way that does not match her. So they may be setting her up for failure and they may not hire her. And when I heard this, I heard about it 
um, from another colleague who said we may have to sort of be a safety net under this person and, and give her um, classes at both of our colleges while she finds a different so I got so angry at the idea that they would do this to my friend that when we spoke on the phone, I, instead of just listening to her, I was like, I can't believe they're doing this. This is ridiculous. You're going to have to leave there. You're, and and she had already gotten to a place where she was like, I'm going to put my best foot forward. I'm going to submit my application. I'm going to make my materials the best they can be. And if they don't hire me, then that's going to be their loss. And I came in with this negative attitude and I wasn't impeccable with my word. And today I texted her and I said, I want to apologize for being the negative Nelly that I was the other day. And you need to know that I support you 100% in everything that you do. And I, I want to help you. And please forgive me for, for my negativity. Thank you, Emily. Um, so we have a couple of people in the chat sharing. Um, I've learned, especially from school, that to be more conscious of what we say. Yes, same. I'm very harsh with my words and I'm learning your words can hurt others. So be polite and patient um, could lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. Very interesting. Very interesting, Farid. It's so important for us to think about this idea that, right, to th this is great. Yes, Raja. Um, I, I learned to think before saying something. So it's almost like being that moment of mindfulness right? You think something, count to three. Think about the question, like, would you say it in front of the person or to the person? And if not, check yourself, right? If you would want it said to you, then you can say it. If you would not want to hear what you is about to come out of your mouth, swallow hard, <laughs> right? Like you need to be able to consider what it's going, because really, it's going to hurt you more potentially than the other person. And it was something that I learned as I sent this text to my friends, realizing how upset I still was from our conversation. Exactly. There's that golden rule. And this is what, you know, so again, when, when we say that this Toltec wisdom and this framework for the agreements really does respect all of the other teachings of the, the sort of world, we're bringing it back to, if you don't have anything nice to say, swallow hard. Don't say it. <laughs> Treat others the way you want to be treated. And being impeccable with your word is all about that. It's it's about making sure that, you know, and, and sometimes there's a lot of things in the moment where we don't even think, but there are cultural slippages, right? Um the other day I was on the phone because I had to make hotel reservations for my students who will be traveling to California for a festival. The woman who I was speaking with had an accent. She was either working in a, in a phone bank in another country or she was an immigrant to this country and she was working on the phone in this hotel's um, customer service area. And at one point she was like, and I was asking a question and she was like, hold on girl, hold on girl, hold on girl. And I was like, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. What did you just say? And I said, did you just call me girl? And she's like, yes. And I said, okay, I'm going to take a step back. And we were on the phone. We weren't like communicating over zoom. I couldn't see her face or anything. And I said, I'm going to take a step back. So my name is Dr. Christina Marin. So if you want to say anything, like say, you can use my terms of Dr. Marin or you can say Miss Marin or whatever you, but, I, and it might, and I said this, I said, it might be something that's cultural, that in language, you're translating something you might say in your own native language that isn't exactly translating to an American context of customer service. And I said, I am not going to, call your manager. I am not going to complain about you. I am not going to file any kind of report or whatever. I said, what I want to do is give you the gift to say, you might not want to use that language with the next customer and, and just say, you know, their name. Or, and it's such a cultural thing because I didn't take offense to it in the strong way that someone else might. 
in the United States, right? Do we all agree with that? It's like, there are some people who would be like, oh, I'm calling your manager. I want to talk to your supervisor. You're going to get in trouble. I'm going to make you lose your job. Don't ever call me that again. And for me, I was like, oh, this is a teachable moment. This woman needs to learn this you know, someone else might be more upset about this. And that's the idea that I always go back in my own mind into like the be impeccable with your word. I could have kept my mouth shut and not said anything to this woman who's going to be in this customer service position, at least for the foreseeable future. And I wanted to help her rather than sort of have an argument with her. So being impeccable with our word has many different contexts. Does anyone else want to share a story like Emily shared with us? Everyone's adding a lot of great stuff to the chat too. Just keep on adding to the chat because we'll we'll monitor that. Yes. Oh, I'll turn my camera on. It's because I have the background. So I feel Hi. like for me, I will say like how um it was in the comment saying harsh words. Back in high school, I was I didn't understand the difference of being realistic and being like straight up harsh. Um, and so I would just tell people the reality of things, not understanding about their emotions and feelings, thinking, oh, if I can take it, you should be able to take it. So I'm just like, I have recently, like, I've learned as growing up, like, if I'm not going to like it, why should I do that to them? And it's the sense of I have to be empathetic with what I say as well, understanding that not everybody is like me. So that's where I've learned that. <laughs> and my even my my fiance tells me all the time he's like you need to like not talk to me like I'm a kid you have to know the difference you're not like talk to your friends like your friends you're not their professor you're not nothing like you you know you know your place I'm like eh. you have touched on so many incredible incredible parts about being impeccable with your word and you know some of the times where I think the word there have been difficult moments in my life as a professor where students often feel very empowered when they have the anonymity of um, student evaluations for faculty, right? And sometimes there's a lot of harsh language that's used in student evaluations. But I would challenge every single one of us, instead of being like negative, like I'm gonna be honest, I've had some horrible professors in my life, absolutely. And people need to learn how to be better professors, but they're not necessarily gonna learn how to be better professors if we shoot them down. They're not even gonna wanna be better professors. The constructive criticism that you have the opportunity to offer in that evaluation, even because it's anonymous too, but you also have the ability to say to professors, you know, in, in direct communication, send an email, you know, this is something that I experienced in your class that I'm not sure you're aware of, but it might be helpful to you. I just think blah, 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 right? That's constructive feedback, right? Instead of being like, I, I don't even know, like there are so many different things that I've heard through, um, one of my colleagues said the most harsh that she'd ever, um, received and she was a literature professor was like this professor is a complete charlatan which is like a fake person they have no idea about their field they're just you know completely phoning it in and faking it and this one has a doctorate degree in literature so you know it was, it was so shocking that that's how someone perceived her that she was very upset by it um it went from a discomfort to constructive criticism for the worker. Is that a particular situation, Emily? In, in or were you talking about like the um, the faculty feedback? I was talking about the faculty feedback because um, when you're like upset ab about a situation when you're at work or anything, it could really go from like a really big argument to like, a, oh, okay, here's something that we could work on. And it's really about the, the, the way you navigate it. Absolutely, absolutely. That is an excellent point. Daima, thank you so much for also sharing, right? Your sense of discovery and your identity development and how you, um, your own self-progress and that you're still working on it, right? Like we're all, continually in a state of becoming. None of us is finished developing. 
that's going to take us our whole lives. And until we are no longer here, we're going to be developing, right? Um, okay, anyone else want to say anything about this idea of being impeccable with your words, speaking truth? And part of it also, I think, you know, this idea of speaking truth to power, right? To be impeccable with our word is to not stay silent when something needs to be said to stand up for the people who we don't necessarily think might stand up for themselves. Now, I would get permission from them first, right? Um, but th there is a lot going on in the world right now where a lot of people are choosing to speak for entire peoples, entire countries, entire like citizenship of the planet, and yet, that's not, you know, you, you have to speak from the I, right? And empower other people to also speak their truth and speak from the I. But you also need to advocate. So being impeccable with your word really does mean advocating for, for people. Jason, do you want to add anything? I feel like I want to make sure that, you know, because we have all this experience of running this workshop together, if there's anything from speak, speaking impeccably, um, that has resonated with you in the past that you want to bring forward? You know, you mentioned some of it, and I've actually talked to some of our students about it, and I think you and I have had similar experiences with it. It's, you know, being a student who went to Columbia University and being in that environment um, that has been sort of hollowed out of the real world, right, because it's Morningside Heights, whatever, um, but it's in Harlem, right? And we, we just, we kind of like, a, when I was there, it never really felt comfortable with me. And I always felt like there were people who were not being represented. And I felt like I needed to use my words. But as you said, to get that permission is so, sometimes very difficult to do, right? It's a hard conversation to have. So I'll just share here that my thesis project, um, the play that I wrote was about the, the intercession of of a white man into a black community and it was my way of taking my my view of what was going on up at columbia and putting it into words so that it could be performed on a stage uh in front of people so that i could share that experience and maybe people would realize certain things uh, like a mirror putting a mirror to right to the community that would come and view the the play. That's that's the one that that stands out to me and in response to what you were just talking about. I love it. Is that my favorite German? Did German just join us? I think I've known German as long as I've known Jason. Yes, it's German. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm gonna not get emotional now. <laughs> All right. Should we move to the second agreement? If you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. Zora Neale Hurston. That is an amazing quote for this agreement. I really appreciate that. That is, that is really great. Okay. Okay. We're going to move to the next one. I'm going to close this up a little bit and then see if we can take it. now this is the hardest thing any of you you're all going to be like that's impossible no one can do that um now i want to also share that one of the things that i've done with this work is in a book that was just recently published about teaching specifically but more generally in in like also more generally but teaching specifically acting techniques to latino students I published an article or chapter in that book that was all about using this framework to teach acting. Imagine when I say to my acting students, never take anything personal. Everything we do in theater is literally putting ourselves out on stage and letting people look at us. So everything is personal. If people don't clap, you take it personally. If people boo, you take it personally. If people applaud and, and hoot and holler for more, we take it personally. It's great, right? But taking stuff personally 
has a, a really important context here. Um, okay, so this is what this means in this framework. Nothing others do is because of you. Essentially, it's because of them. What others say and do is a projection of their own reality, their own dream. Right. And in terms of dreams here, we're not talking about you go to sleep at night and you dream something. Your dream is the existence and the reality in which you live. Right. The dreamscape of. Right. If you if you actually like, you know, if you're on the subway and you look around at how many people are just in that subway car and multiply their existence, you realize, you know, we're all a very small part of the existence on this planet. And, and the reality is our reality is the most important to us. Of course it is, it's our reality. So our dream, our reality is important to us. And what others say to us or about us really is a projection of their reality, their dream. When you become immune, when you are immune to the opinions and actions of others, you won't be the victim of needless suffering. Okay, we need to unpack this because again, I tell you, don't take anything personal and you're like, okay, this woman's absolutely out of her mind. Everything is personal. And the reality is only if you let it be, if you let it be personal, right? Someone wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, doesn't have coffee, is late on the subway, the train stops for like 30 minutes at like, 42nd street and doesn't go any further and their day is not going well and they come in and they don't like your sweater you like your sweater great you didn't buy it for them they don't gotta wear it no one asked them really but they don't like your sweater that color doesn't look good on you okay in your eyes but when i look at myself in the mirror in this sweater I love what I see. Everything comes from inside of someone else's reality. And so when I talk about this in an acting framework, right? I have students who are very young. They're community college students. They're young. They're coming out of high school. They were the stars of their theater program and everyone loved them. And then they come here and they do some harder work on their acting skills, on their singing, on everything that they're doing, on their design work. And we start to criticize in the most constructive way to say, this is the next steps you need to take to be better. Not, oh, wow, you suck. Whoever gave you a standing ovation, right? Like, no, we just want the, you know, if you come to college to study something that you already know how to do, Pay me on the side. I'll teach you something different. I'll teach you some voice exercises, right? You shouldn't know anything at the beginning about what your major is because that's what you're paying tuition for. Don't pay tuition for stuff you already know. That's not good. That's not good money spent. The idea of me saying to someone, okay, that monologue, you have it memorized. That's a positive. But now we have to take a brush and paint emotion into it and color it with different um, ideas and context so that the, the audience member is moved by what you're saying. At this moment, I'm not moved. Let's get you there, right? So the idea, that's not a personal thing against that person, that that person's not good. That's criticism and constructive criticism about how do we get you from this moment to the next so that this monologue, right? When you, when you, th this is the whole idea of like education. When we examine, when you take an exam, right? You take an exam, your midterm exam, and you get a 60 and your teacher's like, wow. Now I see where the holes are. And I have to go back and revisit, right? The, the good professor will look at their students' exams. He will examine. She will look at the results. They will absolutely approach the results and say, this isn't necessarily the students that aren't getting this answer. It's me that's not necessarily teaching 
so that they have the answer. So going back, right? It's not, when you don't do well on an exam, it's not a personal reflection on you. It is, how do you get the knowledge? Is there a different way that you can study for that type of exam? Is there a different tactic? Is there a different chapter that maybe you didn't review that you can work with your faculty or with a study group, right? Study groups where different people have different scores in different classes. Wow. Hey, I see that you got an 85 on that test or you got an 80. I got a 60. Can we look at some of the, the questions on this test? And, and can you share with me how you, right? The, education is not about standing still because of a number. Education is about taking it to the next level. And the reality of like, you know, Student Leadership Academy, forming group study like sessions where you take a leadership role and you say in this class, is there anyone else who wants to do some review? I'd like to set up a time. I'm going to be in, you know, the, the student leadership um, space on Thursday afternoon. Anyone who wants to come bring your test. Let's go over some of this stuff because I want to be ready for the final. And you get to that and you talk to your faculty member. And you say, so we've been meeting and we have some questions and we just want to know if there are any other resources, right? That's taking a leadership role in that conversation. It's not personal. It's easy for it to feel personal. That's the easy way out. For you to say, this isn't personal against me. I need to know what I need to do to get from point A to point B. Make that your personal, like your delta or your change, right? Delta is the triangle. It's the Greek symbol for change. Your triangle needs to become your focus, not how someone said something and you felt that it was personal. So put these two together, right? Be impeccable with your words and don't take anything personal. You have the yin and the yang of walking in the world in a different way. Right? Both of these things, if you are impeccable with your word, if you don't say things to hurt yourself or other people, and you lead by example and other people stop saying things to hurt other people, then people are going to have left, less stuff to take personally because people are going to be walking differently in the world. Does anyone want to share an experience that they had where, oh, sorry, where you took something personal or someone else took something personal that you did, right? Sometimes it's harder to tell the stories. Well, go back. Sometimes it's harder to tell the stories where we are the, um, sort of the perpetrator of what, um, of what happened in the in the narrative that we're telling it's harder but sometimes that's what ownership about these ideas of agreement like if we're going to change these things about ourselves we have to confront the times where maybe we did take something personally and it affected a relationship that we had or it affected um, a class that we were in anyone want to share anything Anna. Hi. Yeah, I wanted to definitely just um, hop on some points that you made about um, those points and times that we come across where we're like, we have to really sit there and evaluate. And I find that to be challenging because it really does take a practice of mindfulness um, to both take practice about what you have said and what another person may have misinterpreted. Sometimes we may um, feel the need or the urgency to kind of like want to clear up that up, but we're really teaching one another. And some people, you know, we just learn at our own paces. Sometimes we can get that we said we made a mistake and we can correctify and some other, maybe we have the expectation of someone else doing the same or at the same rate, but it just, it just doesn't come. So it's a lot of mindfulness and patience with oneself first, then to have it for another. So important. That whole idea of the, the different stages of development that people can be at, the readiness that someone may have to be uh, to be confronting these, these ideas. And, and confronting is sometimes looked at as a harsh 
word, but I like that you, you know, like you say, this is a challenge, right? Challenge isn't a bad thing. Challenge is where we find most opportunity, right? We challenge ourselves to go hiking, right? You challenge yourself to have only one cup of coffee in the morning instead of six. Um, you challenge yourself in different ways that can make things better for you. But you're completely right, Anna. Different people are at different stages in their own identity development, right? The whole star model um, and all of the different things that, that you're focusing on, um, this idea of identity development, we, are, we will never all be at the same page. In, 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 even if we're in a class um, with people who are from our same demographics, our same age group, all of the different, you know, kind of factors, um, we're all still gonna be in very different points of our development. Um, and I think it's very important that one of the things that you touched upon is I'm gonna put something in the chat. Um, I'm gonna see if I can put this in the right way. Um, okay, let's see. Um, this is a model for communication, right? You have a sender, like the speaker, the sender, even if it's not verbal, right? Someone does something, a physical like hand gesture or facial expression. And that what they've said or done contains a message, right? So that message I've put in capital letters in the chat, right? The message exists on its own. And the sender can mean one thing, but the receiver might interpret it as something else. So just go ahead and, and either raise your hands in the reactions on, on the Zoom call um, or write in the chat, yes. Um, how many of you have ever like said something and not gotten the reaction that you expected and later realized your receiver did not get your humor, did not get your communication, right? How many of you have ever had that experience where you say something? There you go, right? Jason's raising his hand. I'm raising my hand. Everyone is, right? Like there's moments where, you know, the the very, um, there we go. Yep, me, I have the very essence of this. If you forget to write it in a text, your friend is gonna like not text you back. And two weeks later, you're gonna text your friend and be like, I haven't talked to you, I haven't seen you, what's going on? And they're like, well, you said this. And then you're like, um, JK. And they're like, you didn't say LOL. I thought you were serious. And you're like, no, I was not serious. I was totally joking around. And I mean, relationships are like halted in their tracks because people don't say L-M-A-O, right? We all have this experience. We, we have this like shorthand of letting people know how we're like our communication shorthand. Yes, and especially you put sarcasm in a text. I, I, I often listen to the woman in my car who sends my text messages, right? And like, I speak in Spanish sometimes or or I'll get a text from my husband or from my comadre and it will be like, comadre, esta bien, voy a listar la bebe. And I'm like, oh my God, what did she just say? Oh, she's getting my baby ready to go to leave La Guarderia. Okay, right? But if you asked her something about sarcasm, she's like, I don't know what you're talking about doesn't sound very sarcastic. This whole idea of the, the idea of communication, when we put communication through um, technology, this is something that I think is really important in light of where we are right now with artificial intelligence. And how many of you wanna take that shortcut and just put that writing prompt in the artificial intelligence? I can tell you right now, faculty can tell when it is not your writing. <laughs> Be careful and really think about 
how you use, because artificial intelligence is going to be a good thing for us if we can all figure out how to use it on the same page. Um, Kaishia, can you uh, add to our, our conversation? Did yes. I pronounce your name right? No, Keisha. my name is, it is Keisha, yes. Keisha, Keisha. I, when I looked back at it, I was like, Kaishia is not how to say that. Thank you, apologies. Yes, um, I did want to say that, oh, I just lost my train of thought because of that. Oh, was that uh, artificial intelligence or yeah. um okay so i wanted to say truly a lot of those people who are behind those chat gbt's their writing is not good it sounds like a blogger on some random site like a professor is going to know <laughs> yep, we do we do and it's it's interesting so, so Raja, I, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, says they had a professor who only does class writing assignments because of ChatGPT. So you have to physically write your work in the classroom. Yeah. Going back to like, like writing out assignments on notepads in front of your faculty member. Wow. And, and AI again, is there are good uses to it. It's not a bad thing necessarily, but we have to be careful. Technology is only as smart, as Keisha's pointing out, only as smart as the people who are managing it, right? So we have to be careful. I have specific assignments that I tailor in a way that you really can't plug something into a chat GPT or an AI and say, well, like it's specific about your opinion about a play that we've watched in class. So if it's too general, like I'm teaching students how to write about scripts. I'm teaching students how to write about theater. So when a, an AI is writing their work, I can totally tell. Um, but these are all really, really excellent points, right? The, the idea of taking things personally, right? Part of it is, Many of your faculty, you're going to use AI in your class and you're going to generate an assignment. And, and your faculty, if they're smart, they're not going to take it personally. You're not necessarily doing it because you don't like them. That's not what it's about. You might be doing it to save time. You might be doing it because you don't necessarily believe that this class is going to affect the rest of your life for whatever reason. But it's not about taking it personally, right? It's about your education is going to be as strong as what you put into it. So if you plug a lot of it into a chat GPT and you're not doing the work of education, then you're not going to get the benefit of education. Does that make sense? But like education is such a gift and there are people all around the world who have had to fight to have it as a human right right? So many, in, in so many different spheres, right? The idea of gender and gendered education is a, is a very big problem. Like, you know, some genders and some people with different orientations are not welcome in university settings um, or in school at all. Um, people of color, um, not welcome in schools, right? Like we, we go back and we look at history, but in many countries, those still, those separations still exist. Um, and so we need to we need to appreciate the human right that we have in the ability to be in this space right now. This is education and this is a privilege. We being in this space together is 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 pretty pretty good, right? We, we have access to this kind of conversation, this kind of dialogue where we can share our, our ideas openly. I love it. I love it. Um, Jason, anything to add? No, I'm just listening. I, I and I'm enjoying. So keep going. Okay. Anyone else want to add anything about taking anything personally? Because the next one is also a pretty tough one. The last one is really super easy. So I want to make sure, <gasps> my dear friend. One of my favorite people. German, enlighten me. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Marin. Hi, my love. How are you? It's been a long time. We go way back. Way back. I was saying that I know German as long as I know Jason, I think. Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo estás? Buenas tardes. Feliz okay. año nuevo. Gracias. 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 Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, it's been um, it's been a long time um, uh, uh, since I graduated from Hostos Community College. Um, and um, right now, um, uh, right now, recently, um, uh, I've been unemployed ever since I got my associate's degree in in, in liberal arts. Um, it's been a tough time for me. So um, so um. I'm trying to over. Uh, I'm trying to overcome some uh, some sort of um, uh, mental negative thoughts. Um, despite the situation of the uh, of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic that happened. Uh, um, that had that had me lose my previous job as a as a scorekeeper and and and, and maintenance worker and, and and things of that nature. And, and um, I've been utilizing um other resources out there, and especially throughout the uh, throughout the city of New York. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm also uh, I'm also um. I'm also a part of this uh, workforce agency called, called Goodwill, Goodwill Industries. Um, um, they too help people with disabilities as well, and I'm trying to um, um, develop um, um, some sort of um, coping mechanisms uh, uh, to uh, to overcome certain situations. And I'm um, I'm planning on 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 getting a new job with a new job with this uh, temp agency, or United Staffing Solutions. Um, one of their mm -hmm. positions is called a uh, direct direct support professional, and things like that. Though, uh, doctor. Excellent. That sounds like a great opportunity. Yes, and yes, and um, hopefully in the future I can go back to school. Um, heading back to college to pursue a, a, a bachelor's degree. Um, um, I just need to, I just need to be financially stable enough, and, and um, I need to earn some uh extra money for me to um, um pay some of the uh, tuitions and and and, and other expenses, and, uh, other expenses and and things of that nature. Excellent. I think that that's great, and I think this framework of having the um, the four agreements. And then also when we get to the energy vampires, like really understanding what the negativity is that you can control in your life and, and being able to use this, these two frameworks, I think is going to be very helpful as you take those next few steps. Claro, por supuesto. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I love that Jason is teaching that to you on the Hostos campus. Um, Dynma, you're talking about Jason talking about AI and and just continue to focus on how we can benefit from it and how not to abuse it. Um, all right, let's we are at the hour mark, so let's continue our journey into the agreements. Um, here's a tough one. Don't make assumptions. Some people will say, well, you know what happens when you assume and they break down the word. The reality is assumptions hurt us. You make an assumption, you don't ask the specific question that you want answered, and you just assume the answer, you're going to have an issue. So let's take a look at what Don Miguel Ruiz outlines as the don't make assumptions agreement. Find the courage to ask questions and express what you really want. Communicate with others as clearly as you can to avoid misunderstandings, sadness, and drama. And when I use this framework with my acting students, I say to them, the drama needs to stay on the stage. The drama shouldn't be in our classroom because I need to be able to know what you need to be able to give that to you, right? So asking the questions. With just this one agreement, you can completely transform your life. If you stop assuming, right? Like I've said to several of my students when they come to me and they say, I'm not really sure what my professor in this other class wants. And so my first question is, did you ask them? And they often say, no. Okay, well, let's start there. Maybe in the next class, you can raise your hand and say, so on this assignment, is what you're looking for this or is it something different? Asking the questions and not just taking for granted, that, right? Like I, I have colleagues that are like, why do I have to always say it's in the syllabus? Well, maybe you could just answer the student's question because they've put it to you and if it's in your syllabus, I assume you still know what you wrote in the syllabus. Just tell them. You don't have to make them feel stupid. Just tell them, 
right? And this is something, and I'm going to be completely transparent. This is something that I have had to learn in a very difficult context. My mother has Alzheimer's disease. And in the very early stages of this, and I'm talking about nine, 10 years ago, when my mother first started to repeat questions, you had me and my older sister and my younger sister, three very feisty Latinas, who spent a lot of time saying, Mom, you just asked that question. Stop. You just ask that. Until we actually got a neurologist to do a, an evaluation and a psychologist to sit, spend time with my mother who said, yep, your mother is at the early stages of Alzheimer's at 71 years old. Um, all of a sudden, my sisters and I, who are also maybe feisty Latinas, but feisty Latinas in academia. So feisty Latinas who are all professors and graduates of like really good programs around the country. And we started doing the research. And the beauty of some of the research narratives that say, what does it cost you to answer the question again? I don't have to put a quarter into a bucket every time I ask. If every time my mother asks a question again, she asks me, where are we going? We're going to the doctor. Okay. Five minutes later in the, in the car, still going to the doctor. Where are we going? To the doctor. Where are we going? You have an appointment with the doctor. Where are we going? We're going to see the obstetrician. Where are we going? We're going to the doctor. Spice it up. Add some information, right? But it doesn't cost me anything to know that my mother is not asking that question a hundred times. It's the disease that my mother has that is asking that question over and over again. So it doesn't matter if one student asks it on Monday and says, so where am I supposed to get this information? Oh, and you can certainly say a great resource for that is on the syllabus, but that's in chapter five. But just remember, you have the syllabus always, you know, kind of think about, should I check the syllabus and, you know, but you certainly can ask questions in my class, but that's what I get paid to do is educate and answer questions, right? And so I, I have had actually some conversations with some of my colleagues to say like, why do you say that? Like, oh, it's on the syllabus. You wrote it. You should know it by heart. Just answer the question and don't make your student look stupid in front of the other classmates because that's unfair to them. Check the syllabus is three words. The answer to the question might be seven. Do you don't have time in your class to say seven words instead of three? So German, you had your hand up. You were gonna say something? Yes, I thought the Marion. What I was gonna add is that um um back in the back in the year of of two thousand and six, two thousand eighteen, mm -hmm. I was completing my second semester um, um uh, to pursuing a bachelor's degree, and um one of my family members was too uh, overcoming a, a a mental health diagnosed matter. So and um and um it brought it brought me down a lot until I had to seek professional help. Um, for me to regain my confidence back, for me to regain my uh, my uh, strength and, and my strength and um energy back, um um, just to get my life back on track and, and, and to where I, to where I am right now though, and, and um, I'm still seeking I'm, I'm still seeking more resources and I'm I'm still seeking a better hope and um, I also uh, I also did a research paper back at, back while I was taking um an English class um for uh, for uh, for advanced learning uh, back when I was in hostels um. Uh, right before I started graduating. Excellent, taking ownership of that, that whole aspect of your life. I love that, I love that. Yes, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Keisha. Yeah, I wanted to say, so um, this past semester um, in my marketing research class, I was the project director and I had um, all of us, were in around the same degree field. Um, and there was one student who was like showing up to class, but wasn't really trying to contribute to the group. And then one day I got a notice from the professor and him, like kind of explaining what was going on. And he had um, a learning issue, right? And I was like, you know, like truly, um, 
I was like, it's no big deal. I'm, I'm not asking if you don't feel comfortable doing what you chose to do. Maybe we can get someone to switch with you for a different role that fits you better, you know? But I, I tried to like teach him cause he's a freshman. He said he was a freshman and I'm a junior. And I was like, truly in life, not everybody gets the same playing field. So as long as you show effort and you know that, you know, like you may not be as good as somebody who that's like their specialty, but as long as you show effort in group projects and you do the best work you can, like people will respect it more instead of like saying, oh, I have this. So I just am not, not going to do any work. I mean, one of the things is that we we don't know the shoes that other people walk in until they either share that with us or someone from the college shares it with us. Um, you know, the reality of faculty are often alerted when a student has, um, you know, uh, special accommodations in a class for whether it be a learning disability or, you know, some kind of other um, disability from resource services, they send us something. But of course, it's it's, you know, very clear you don't broadcast that to the class but in this case the teacher wanted to you know empower you to work with this student in the group and i think it's so important because otherwise you're making assumptions about why the student's not participating and not necessarily knowing and and for you to go that extra mile to be able to help that student because you know um they need right they've like you said we're not all working with the same deck of cards, so to speak, right? Like we're all dealt different hands. And at the same time that you don't want people to make assumptions about you, you want to make sure that you're not making assumptions about other people. This is, it's such a great um, example of, of this agreement in practice. Um, yeah, it actually helped me. Um, I am striving to be a future leader in the world so it did help me in um like an experience way of realizing how to deal with those type of situations so in the future you know I always know how to handle myself and all of these agreements hopefully will also become part of your toolkit your, you know, you have this like tool belt on you and you can take these tools out whenever you need them and think about them, right? I sit on the board of directors for the Children's Theater Foundation of America. And last May, my colleague and I, we shared these agreements with that board of directors. And I said, I want you to keep like a little notebook of like moments, it's like your four agreements notebook, moments where the four agreements became part of your everyday existence or, you know, on a monthly basis reflect, was there anything that happened in my life this month um, that was part of the four agreements? Did I not speak impeccably? Did someone else use the word against me and I noticed that they weren't being impeccable? Did I make any assumptions? Did someone make an assumption about me that I had to clarify? Things like that. Um, it clears up so much misunderstanding when we reflect on all of this. Um, before we transition to energy vampires, because part of all of this it, working in regards to energy vampires is important. I wanna show you the final agreement. And this one is gonna be easy and hard at the same time, okay? Always do your best. And that may sound really easy, um, but I can, I'm sure that there are people in this room who during the last three years dealt with COVID. I don't think there's one of us in this room, whether or not we had it ourselves, but I can tell you that at six months, my daughter had COVID, six months old. Maybe you had a family member. Maybe you yourself had COVID. I know people who like post, I've had COVID now five times. This one is this kind of version of it, right? And we've all, it's touched all of our lives. And so our best is different on any given day. Let me just have us read this so that we can know the framework around which we're talking. Your best is going to change from moment to moment. It will be different when you are healthy as opposed to sick. Under any circumstance, 
Simply do your best and you will avoid self-judgment, self-abuse, and regret. That is an important element about walking in the world beginning today. Knowing that in the circumstance, there are days where your best is 150% and there are days where your best is 75%. And there are times when maybe it's 25% and that's all you've got to give and don't ask for any more anyway, <laughs> right? I've been there, you've been there. But that you're still giving 100% of that 25% is working within the four agreements. It's not easy. Nope, it's not easy. But there are moments when it is easy and then there are moments when it's harder. So part of this, I, one of the things that I really, I wanna see if I can play this video, I think is on the next, um, the next, this page. I wanna see if it'll come up and if you all can see it and hear it. If not, I'm going to send a link to Jason to have all of you to, to send it, or I can actually put it in the chat. Um, but I want to see first if we can. Can you hear it? Yeah. Okay. So this is going to add. There we go. Here's, here's what I want you to see. We are constantly being bombarded by problems that we face. And sometimes we can get completely overwhelmed. The story of the hummingbird is about this huge forest being consumed by a fire. All the animals in the forest come out and they are transfixed as they watch the forest running. And they feel very overwhelmed, very powerless except this little hummingbird. It says, I'm going to do something about the fire. So it flies to the nearest street, takes a drop of water, puts it on the fire, and goes up and down, up and down, up and down, as fast as it can. In the meantime, all the other animals, much bigger animals, like the elephant with a big trunk, could bring much more water. They are standing there helpless, and they are saying to the hummingbird, what do you think you can do? You're too little. This fire is too big. Your wings are too little. And you're big, so small. You can only bring a small drop of water at a time. But as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I'm doing the best I can. And that, to me, is what all of us should do. You should always feel like a hummingbird. I may feel insignificant, but I certainly don't want to be like the animals watching as the planet goes down the drain. I will be a hummingbird. I will do the best I can do. So some of you may know who that is Wangari Matai, a Kenyan woman who began the Green Belt Movement, who passed away uh, in 2011, but started a wonderful movement to replant um, the trees and the forests of Kenya. Um, that idea that your best, right? My best marathon running is certainly not very good. But if I ran a marathon tomorrow, it might take me a month to finish it right? Like run one mile every day for 26 days. Um, and there are people who run marathons in less than three hours, right? But the best that I can do needs to be on my scale to my ability. And within my framework, I can't necessarily compare myself to anyone else that I would be, you know, trying to do as good as someone else Compare yourself to one person, you, yesterday. That's all you have to do. You don't have to compare yourself to any of your siblings. You don't have to compare yourself to any, you know, compare yourself to you yesterday. That's, that's an important part of this framework, always doing your best. 
Um, okay, we have be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Never make assumptions and always do your best. Before we move on to energy vampires, does anyone want to, hold on, I need to open this and I need to get back my chat. Where's my chat? There it is. Anyone want to um, talk about it? Anyway. Okay, we're moving on to energy vampires because at this moment we have 45 minutes, roughly 44 minutes. Um, and I want to spend some time here because this is where a lot of the the four agreements will come into play in the stories that we share, in the narratives that we weave about what is going on in our lives. What do we need to maybe, maybe we need to get rid of it, but maybe we need to just alter our relationship to it. So, oh, I'll go back, go back. Energy Vampires. This is the cover of the book, right? Kind of scary. Um, managing stress and negative thoughts. Uh, is this on Audible? I mean, I've, I don't know if it's on Audible. That's a good question. Um, if you want to check on that and let us know if you find it. Um, managing stress and negative thoughts in your personal and professional life, right? So this is sort of a framework that can go into different aspects of your life. Steve Ornelas is a very good friend of mine, um, a psych professor, and now a real estate agent in Arizona, um, who's ret a retired professor. Um, so let's talk about this. Becoming mindful of the energy vampires in your life. So we want to beware of energy vampires because they will suck you dry if you let them. That's what a vampire does, right? They will absolutely take everything away from you. And the reality is in this framework, you have to remember in terms of this framework, you get to teach people how to te treat you. You can basically set the parameters and set the standards and let people know like I, that's not acceptable. I'm not here for you in that way. So Right now, think about, right? Does anyone know what this is a picture of? You can put it in the chat or just unmute yourself and tell us. Your black hole. That is the black hole, a black hole. There are many of them, yes, black hole. What is a black hole? And I'm not looking for the, the physics, um, engineering, NASA, you know, kind of like, explanation but what is it it's a tear in space that nobody knows goes where it's emptiness it is a tear in space and if you get sucked into that hole no one will find you sometimes energy vampires that's exactly where they want to put you right into that black hole what who or what is draining you of your energy or spirit. And so one of the things that you have to remember in, in this framework, you are not a bad person for recognizing that someone is an energy vampire. You're not a bad person. And it doesn't mean that that person, like how many people, if I said, like for how many people is your is one of your parents an energy vampire? You're not getting rid of them. Yes. They will always be your parent, whether they're here with us still or not. But energy vampire, like, it doesn't mean you're going to get rid of them. But sometimes it's like, okay, that takes a lot of energy from me. So I need to really manage my relationship with this parent. Right? What are the things that are draining you of your energy or spirit. You don't have to put it in the chat. You don't have to tell us out loud. I just want you to be thinking about them in the back of your mind, right? In, in some cases, right, those things are people. In some cases, right, let's say you're taking four classes. Your energy vampire can be that one class, 
that really in the back of your mind, you're like, I'm never going to use algebra in my life, but I have to take algebra because it's an on the core requirements and I have to take it, but it's an energy vampire because it has so much work in that class and I'm never going to use, right? So you have to really change your mindset to algebra. It's what's for breakfast, right? Like I just, I'm going to take it and it will be over. There is an end point to algebra. And at that point, I will put the algebra book away. I maybe will sell it for more money than I paid for it, hopefully. And and you'll move forward in your life. Anyone an algebra major? I don't know if anyone's an algebra major. But, but there's something, and then you're like, oh, but my fashion design class, now that's the class that I want to spend all my time in, but I don't have any time because there's algebra. And algebra is sucking me into the black hole. And that's not okay. Jason and I are going to perform a little bit for all of you, okay? So grab some popcorn, maybe a little refreshment, and Jason and I are gonna go through a little interactive exercise. Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. good. Do you have your props? I do. Excellent, okay. So Jason and I have been friends for, oh my God, almost 20 years now. And Jason is incredible. And sometimes we go to a coffee shop um, because we really want to just hang out together and talk, you know, the way friends talk. And, and this is sort of some of what it looks like. And um, we're going to do an interactive thing. And I have my pens and I'm going to hand them over to Jason. Um, so this is this is what it looks like when Jason and I go to Starbucks. Oh my God, it's so good to see you. I miss you so much. How have you been? Good, it's good to see you. Oh my you. God, you're never going to believe what happened to me this week. It's been absolutely crazy. Like, so first of all, my first problem, my mom, she will not stop asking me like where I am, where I'm going, who I'm going to be with, what time I'm getting back, all of this stuff. It's really absolutely driving me up one wall and down the other. This is my mom. Let me give you my mom pen. Can you believe that? Yes, I don't. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that really is getting to me right now is the relationship that I'm in. Like, I have this feeling that this person is not going to work out for me because they are they seem to be really jealous. Like, they were asking me, like, when I was coming here to see you, they were like, why do you have to spend so much time with Jason, right? Like, why does Jason get all of your time? Why do you give all of your attention to Jason? Jason gets everything from you and I get nothing from you. And oh my goodness, and oh my goodness. And it's like, they're so jealous. Can you believe it? Yeah, I know. Do you ever feel like that? Sometimes. Oh my God, it's totally the case with me. It's always like that with this person. And then, you know what? I have, so, I'm taking five classes right now. Do you know how hard it is to take five classes? It's so hard. I don't know if you've ever taken five classes, but I'm taking five classes right now. And and it's like, they're all very different. So I have like four books for one and six books for another. And I have to spend all this money and it's crazy. And it's like, oh my God, I, it's just so much homework that I barely have enough time. As a matter of fact, you know what? Here, that's all my studying that I have to do. And really like, I didn't even have time for coffee. So I'm gonna have to go now, okay? Um, it was so great to see you again. Um, we'll talk soon, okay? Okay. All right. And scene. So, Jason, can you hold up what you're holding? Hmm, look what I have. Does anyone want to come? Okay, so yes, Daima. I was going to say, isn't that also technically trauma dumping in a way, too? uh-huh you know that's what it's considered um when you're like you go to be with your friend and you're just like venting and you're the only one getting a word across and then you just leave you just like dump everything on your friend so who's the energy vampire in this scene the person like dumping everything Me. you <laughs> right now and there are people like this in our lives right how many people know people like this you know just react or clap or put up a thumbs up or a thumbs down in essence um, we know people like this sometimes. We have to be conscious about not being this person sometimes, right? When there's a lot going on in our lives. Um, but the reality is there are ways also to handle this, right? Jason 
it's not that Jason handled this wrong, right? There are no wrong ways to handle people. But the question is, if Jason ends up holding all three of those pens, what's happened? Oh, Jason's acting is incredible. What happens? He's holding the pens that aren't his. That's exactly it. He's holding the pens. They're my problems. And yet the stress that Jason leaves Starbucks with is tightly clenched in Jason's fists because I just absolutely as, right, the transfer of negative energy. I'm the energy vampire who's basically said, I don't want to think about it. So I just want all the verbal kind of like, blah, 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 blah. And wow, that feels so much lighter because I was able to share it with my friend, Jason. But Jason now has that stress, has that anxiety that I've piled onto them. Now, there are different ways that Jay, there you go. Look at what Jason's doing. What is Jason doing? He's sucking it away. <laughs> He's tucking it away because it's not Jason's problem necessarily, right? The way that he's put it in his pocket, he also, right? I When I do this work at a middle school camp, right? Middle school girls who are learning how to be leaders. It's called Girls Leadership Camp in New Hampshire. And sometimes what they do is instead of using pens, because then I don't want them throwing pens, is they use like, stress balls and like koosh balls and things that are light and like you know feathery and fluffy and i'll say so so the person gives you the problem that is like you know their mom nagging them what do you want to do with it Boop. then they give you the problem that's there like what do you want to do with it Boop. and what do you want to do with the final problem that's too much Boop. let it go it's not your problem it doesn't again it doesn't necessarily hurt to be there for your friend to listen. It does hurt if you hold on to all that so tightly and it winds you up then. You need to be able to let that go, right? Toss him. He isn't Dr. Phil. <laughs> Dr. Phil, who just has all of the negative energy. You know, I think Dr. Phil's at some point gonna explode. Um, you have to really be able to let people in on the secret of how you want to be there for them, right? At any given moment, exactly, that's exactly right. Sometimes it affects you more than your friend. It can start to make you feel more stress and anxiety. And then your friend walks out, they have their coffee in hand and they go onto the subway and they're like, no, no worries. And then you're sitting there like, um, I need more coffee with something stronger in it, right? Like you shouldn't have to take the weight of the world on for your friend. Being there as a friend is really important. So there are really like ways, and I lost all my pens, I'm gonna pick up three new ones. But the reality is if I say to Jason, like this is the problem that's my mom, instead of taking it from me, Jason can always sort of like, let me keep it and say, like, what might you say, Jason? Uh, I hear you. Oh, wait, are you, you're muted, you're muted. I'm sorry, I said. I understand what's going on with your mom. I wish I had something I could tell you about how to deal with it, but I'm not exactly sure that I know all the things. And then maybe just to say, but I'm here for you and I will listen, but you need to know I can't take that problem on for you. So you don't, you don't, I'm not telling you Starting today, alienate all your friends. That's not what I want you to do. I don't want to, I don't want you to be like, look, it's not my problem. Dude, get over it. That's not at all what this workshop is about. It really is about protecting yourself by saying, I hear you. 
I hear you and I want you to know that I hear you and I'm listening, but just know that you know what a great relationship I have with my mom. And I, you know, there are some things maybe that me and my mom do that maybe you want to try with your mom and I'll give you some resources and some tools, but I just need you to know that I can't hold all of your negativity inside for me. Um, and here's the thing. Your friend has to choose how they take that, right? They can either be like, well, thanks for being a lousy friend. That's not what you're doing. You're actually protecting yourself so that you can be a better friend for longer. Being empathic, but having boundaries. This is a great way of putting this in the chat. I love it, Daima. How am I pronouncing your name right? You're pronouncing it like the Spanish way too. Is Daima or Daima? Daima. Daima. Okay, perfect. I love it, Daima. So, so the reality of how you choose to let other people treat you is a lot about the energy vampires that that take up our time, our energy, our positivity, right? Like you want to to be a good friend but you cannot be a good friend at the expense of your health you can be a shoulder but don't be shouldering yes yes so i want us i want to open this space up i want it we have like we've gotten through some of this framework i want to just make sure Right. These are the two men. So the one on the left is Steve Ornelas. There's a link. Um, I think let me put that in the chat. Um, so this is the link to Energy Vampires, if you want to click on that link. And then the link to the four agreements, I'll also put in the chat. Right, both of these books you can get for under ten dollars, um, and I want to for a second stop sharing. Um, and I want us to to just open up a conversation, have a dialogue, um, and have you ask any questions that you have about this framework, things that you might say like, I don't know how to do this in my life. How can I not make a sound like whatever it is that you want to talk about or moments in your life that have been, um, which one is that Kali? The four agreements or um, Dodge energy vampires, the Dodge energy it's vampires. It's on audio book or Google play. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. What are some things? What do you want to talk about? Because that's part of this. Like I've just spent, I'm going to have to open up another Diet Coke because I've just spent an hour and a half really talking a lot. Um, are there questions that you have? Are there things that you've experienced? I have a question. Okay. Well, we have one in the chat. So let's, um, Becca or how do you pronounce your name? Tisha. 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 Sorry, I'm just, I literally have my brain wired to reading things exactly the way I see them because that's what we do in Spanish, right? When you read Spanish, it would be Tequia. Yeah. Tisha. That's why. I love fine. it. It's a beautiful <laughs> name. Tisha Benjamin. Let me, we're going to go to you and then we're going to go back to Daima. My question is a general one. Um, in a leadership, how can I use, or what would be your advice when you're dealing with um, individuals in a leadership role where you have to, you're directing them in there every day? Um, how can I, you know, what's your advice in using these tools to better, you know, get across them where, you know, I'm not assuming anything. I'm trying to be empathetic, but at the same time, don't get too involved, you know. Um, so I work in um, healthcare industry as a manager. 
And at times I feel like my struggle, as you said, like the vampire energy <laughs> and just like the different agreements, it's very hard at times because you have different personalities, different culture. There's so many differences and how I get, you know, how can I, as a manager, when a person comes in front of me, use all these, makes no assumption and what's your advice? So I think someone said something earlier in the workshop about really taking the time to stop, process, and then mm -hmm. speak, right? When we were talking about being impeccable mm -hmm. with your word, right? Yeah. A lot of us fly really quickly to to our words. And sometimes we say things before we've thought about what it is that we're going to say. So mm -hmm. part of it is, I think, one tool that you might be really interested in incorporating is taking things slower, right? And listening and then responding more slowly than sometimes you, because you work in a high pace field. You've got to be constantly managing stuff, right? And people are constantly asking you questions and all of that. Yeah. And it, it does not hurt the other person on the other end of the conversation either for you to say, okay, I want to help you. But in order to help you in the best way that I can, I just want to make sure I understand what you're asking me. And then maybe in your own mind and, and verbally outline what you understand the person is looking for, which really alleviates you making any assumptions, right? Because if okay. something is not right in what you've just repeated to them and they say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. Uh, and that might clarify for them that you got something completely different from what they said. Again, the sender, the message and the receiver. If what you mm -hmm. received was one thing and they're like, no, 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 I don't mean I need the vaccine this week. I need to know from you, when do I need to get this vaccine? Oh, so you don't need it like today. Got it. Okay. And that's adding to your understanding where you're not making assumptions. You're ironing mm -hmm. out all the details of what it is you need, but it's taking that time. Communication. Okay. Here's the thing. I think we live in a society. We live in a generation. This generation that exists out there right now believes and this, I'm just going to, like, this is an example. This is an example. They believe it is more efficient to do this than to say, oh, wow, that just made me laugh so hard. How much more time did it take for me to say, oh, my God, that just made me laugh so hard? <laughs> I'm laughing out loud. <laughs> right? But no, all I have to do is do this. That's all the time I have for you. That's what that's saying to me. All the time I have for you is to write in letters. I don't have enough time to have a conversation for you. I'm going to truncate my communication to you because you're my... So just in case anybody doesn't doesn't see this, I, I want to I want to be uh, uh, respectful. So she's uh, typing LOL, 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 JK, BFF, and for for E. So anybody who Forever. right. It. So if you don't have your chat open on on your screen right now, yeah. If I if all I have in my bandwidth for you is letters. How much am I putting into our communication, right? And, and here's the thing. There's a happy medium to this. There's definitely a fine line because I do understand that generationally, right? I sit, like I said before, I sit on a board of directors where there are quite a few of those directors who are 75 years old and older. These are people who learned communication skills before the cell phone, before computers, they wrote letters, right? These are people who, when they went on vacation, they wrote postcards and sent them to everyone they knew, right? It's a different form and a different way to communicate. And I've said to the president of the organization, you need to understand that when you write an email that when printed is 
three pages long, you need to know that the generation of us who are more in our 40s and 50s, we simply don't have time to read that entire email. I need you to refine. Yes, old school. I need you to refine your thoughts and put them into a bullet pointed list. Be thorough. Don't put emoticons in. I don't need that. I don't need like, you know, abbreviations, but three pages printed. Yes. Yes, German. Anna, you have something you want to share. Please share. Yes. Um, I just wanted to go back to the question that went, the girl was asking, the uh -huh. woman was asking you. Um, she was saying, she was asking you how, you know, how to approach a case scenario that she gave you. And I kind of drew another question from that was, um, and not just how to deal with another individual that you have to be patient with and, you know, choose your words selectively and how to best uh, communicate and have patience with yourself at another individual, but just how much patience would be too much patience because sometimes that you can feel like, you're doing your best efforts and trying to expend the time take into consideration of what you can give so that another person can, uh, you can kind of clear the, the clear, clear the way to, to fluently speak with each, with, with each other and communicate. But then there's this roadblock here where you like, you find yourself getting frustrated and it's like, there's such a limited time between you trying to effectively communicate, being patient with someone else and try to work together and then your own emotions that come in in the way and you're like, man, like I'm really still developing this type of skill. Like I just learned I may not be as patient as I thought I was, but I know darn well I'm trying every effort to try to be like to work around this situation. Absolutely. And I think that's really important. I think what, you know, like, you know, the, the idea of you also don't want to come across as being too patronizing to the other person, right? Like if you're like, uh, um, the idea when someone doesn't necessarily um, speak the language or isn't understanding language as a language barrier and someone thinks, well, if I speak louder, they'll understand me. No, that's not, you know, that's a misnomer. Like stop yelling. They will not understand the language anymore when you're yelling than they did five minutes ago when they were not hearing. You know, like you, communication is tough. Communication across language, across um, generations, across um culture right all of these things it it's very different now than it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago but for me from where i sit it's different in some of the best ways possible because so many more people are sitting at the table having the conversations but that does take more work it absolutely takes more work because the reality is, you know, I I sit in class all the time with my students who are, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 years younger than I am. And they'll say something and I'll turn around and be like, what was that word you just used? What does that mean in this context? And they'll take the time to explain it, right? And I'll learn something new. And that's part of the approach to all of this is like, when we're doing this, we're not only growing ourselves and we're we're learning how to, again, as Jason and I both said, walk in the world in a different way after having this kind of conversation about not taking anything personally, being impeccable with our words, right? It's It is learning how to be, different in a moment where you have to think, oh, wow, I'm going to listen to this person and ask them to repeat what they just said so that I get it and I'm not making an assumption about what they said. Working with this framework does in some cases take more time. But then we have to accept that that's going to be the case, right? That you need more time than just to type LOL, that you need more time than just to sort of put an emoticon in the space, that communication, human communication takes time to be understood and to understand other people. To be a leader, right? To be a leader, learning about leadership, one of the things you also have to know about is followership right? 
But most people are like, that's not a real word. It's okay. I made it up. To be a good leader, you know how you want a leader to treat you as someone on their team. So part of this conversation, like part of the question of how do we use this framework? How do we, like in the moment where you're like, all things are coming at you from different sides and take a second, right? The mindful moment to say, how would I want to be treated if I were the person on the other side of this counter? How would I want to be treated if I were the other person on the side of the folder of information? And take a deep breath and make that sort of transference of, I again, we're going back to that golden rule. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. And making that choice to, in your mind, maybe say one thing and translate that into a very different statement or maybe a question, right? Turning some, like, it's in the syllabus. That's the worst phrase on the planet, right? Now, it sounds different when I say, oh, have you checked this particular section of the syllabus? Because if you haven't, you should, but let me let you know what it says right now. It says that late work will be accepted, but you will lose two points for every business day or class day that passes before you submit that assignment. I don't have to put $5 in a jar because I said that. It doesn't cost me anything to answer my students' question, right? Answering the questions, but also reiterating and not making assumptions about what people are looking for. Leadership, again, is about making sure you know that your whole team or whoever it is that you're leading is on the same page. Because in often many cases, not everyone is on that same page. We've talked about this in several instances with the framework. Sometimes people are at de different developmental stages in their own lives and in their own minds. I had an incident the other day where one of the students in our theater program is someone who is autistic and he is very forthcoming with the fact that he has autism. The first day I met him, he, he took off his medical bracelet and showed it to me, opened it up. There's a piece of paper. It, ex it explains what medications he's on and he put it away, but he is someone who constantly talks. He is constant constantly verbal and he stims so he has to sometimes get up and walk around the classroom we had auditions several weeks ago for a play that's coming up and he was waiting in the lobby to audition and he was talking because that makes him feel more comfortable and there was a woman not a student member of the community who was in the lobby also and I'm the program director for theater, so I have an office. Um, she walked into my office. I was sitting with a student. She walked into my office almost to behind my desk, like to like here, this area right here. And she was like, can I hide loudly? Can I hide out in here? That guy's going to drive me crazy. I said, first of all, ma'am, no, my office is not a hiding space. Secondly, I'm gonna ask you to lower your voice because I don't need my student to hear your negative tone about him. He doesn't deserve for you to disparage him in that way. Well, he's absolutely, guys, ma'am, if you cannot lower your voice, you're going to have to leave. And so she's like, well, forget it. I'm not auditioning for this show anyway. Then I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay here. I'm not gonna drive all this way to come here and be talked to like this. So she could hear how I was talking to her, but she couldn't hear how she was talking about this other human being. So for me, right, like, and I can be honest with you, there is a person inside me, maybe from my NYU days who would have stood up and physically thrown her out of my office with some choice words? Because the girl from Queens is still inside me. <laughs> and I did not need her. To, and, and instead, 
right? Our mascot is the bear. Instead, I put my mama bear hat on and I wanted to protect my student and his feelings and who he is and respect him in his learning space. And I just asked her to leave. And she was like, um, this is ridiculous. And she's gone. We need to make choices in the moments, right? Like, believe me, several thousand different things went through my mind of things to say in that moment. But I took sort of stock and I've been able to navigate this a little bit more because I have like the experience of dealing with some of these issues. I took a deep breath and I made a choice on how to communicate with her, asking her to lower her voice, asking her not to say those things and telling her that no, she didn't have the privilege or the entitlement to walk into a professional's office and hide because someone was driving her crazy. I, it took a lot in me. It took a lot in me, but I was trying to be impeccable with my word. I did not make an assumption about anyone else being in the hallway or whatever. You know, like I basically said, this is not okay. I need to make this a safe space for my student. I did the best that I could in that moment. I didn't take what she was saying personally against me. When she said, I'm not going to stay here and I'll do I didn't take that personally. I didn't care. I chose to let her go. We need to make choices in our life. Part of maybe the answer to Anna's question and Tisha's question is it's about making choices in the moment. And it's about sort of, in, in, you know, like I would love for all of the campuses to, to have in their leadership um, spaces and offices, right? Copies of these two books that you can go and check out and bring back for someone else um, just to be able to read and say, how is it in my life that I'm going to use this framework? Because I mean, I, I literally scratched the surface, right? I'm just like, it's like making raspados with ice, piraguas. I'm literally scratching the surface. There's so much depth to the way that Don Miguel Ruiz writes, to the way that Steve Ornelas writes, I highly recommend you digging deeper. Yes, the example of the woman making assumptions because she didn't take, and, and maybe she was like, oh, this kid, um, you know, just is, is just rambling and rambling. And maybe he's nervous because he has this audition. Of, oh, she had no idea. She had no reason to have any idea that he had autism, but she did have an expectation to respect another human being, right? He wasn't doing anything to hurt her. It's a really, really good um, sort of summary of what that woman, like she was making assumptions. She also made an assumption that my office was a place where she could hide out. <laughs> and it's like, wow. That's just not okay. I'm sorry. Am I answering? Some people are triggered differently and it takes a lot of patience to cultivate differences in others. Although a clash with what you're aligned doesn't mean you have to forget that you can also let go of emotions that will weigh you down. Carry only yourself as best you can and others when they can't for themselves and absolutely need, but both require balance. Uh, balance is, it, the key word is your last word there, Anna. Balance. Our walking through this world is a balancing act. Because as people have been sharing throughout, right? The idea of working in a group with someone who you may assume is just blowing off the assignment, but might have three jobs. They're taking 18 credits they have two small children and are taking care of a grandparent or a parent. That's a different life from the life that I live. And I can't make the same assumption about that person's time that they have, or if they have a learning disability, that they have the same understanding of the assignment that I have. Keisha. Um, 
you know, I want to say back to my earlier example, um, I got exposed to both sides of this. Um, one of the group members was actually going through a bunch of stuff. He had surgery. And so um, the thing that I did like a little more, because I, I did try to be more transparent and help the other student, but even though this student was going through all this extra life stuff, he was like, what can I do to help? Even though he, you know, wasn't really following the project as well because of life circumstances. And he didn't tell me everything, but I was like, yo, I know how life is. I'm not a traditional college student. It's okay. Just, uh, we're doing this part. I need help with this, you know? And, um, as someone who wants to be in a leadership position, it, it's been teaching me so many valuable things about like people because they don't tell you Well, most of the time. Absolutely. And I think there's something that we all need to be very clear about in terms of the sphere of education, right? There are these things that we all know about, of course, that are called standardized tests, right? Now, standardized is a word that means all things are equal. So all students from high schools across the country should be able to perform on what is considered a standardized test. However, there are students who when they were in the kindergarten class in the private school that they've been in from K through 12, they were handed an iPad. And every year since then, they've gotten a new iPad because the other one is outdated. And then there are students who are in schools across this country who cannot take textbooks home because there aren't enough and the budget doesn't cover enough for each student to have their own textbook. So all of the homework has to take place in class. So there's there is no, there can be no such thing as standardized testing until there are standardized inputs into every school in the United States, right? The idea that we don't have any kind of standard, standardization of the, the content that we have or the facilities that are, right? Like, I've walked into high schools that have more state-of-the-art theater facilities than I do at a community college or that even there are at a university because there's some kind of money that was able to build a performing arts center at different schools. So there's no standardized anything in terms of, right? Like we, we all have to really recognize and I there there's been many years of education teaching right teaching of professors that says you need to teach you need to treat your students as if they're all the same but then right there are multicultural education experts who say like just try an experiment give every single one of your students in the room a piece of paper have them crumple it up and hold the garbage can up at the front of the room and have everyone try, the person who's sitting next to the garbage can and the person who's sitting at the back of the room, have them all try and throw that crumpled piece of paper into that garbage can. That is a metaphor for all of the different things, right? The person sitting in the back row maybe has so many different circumstances in their life that make it impossible for them to get that piece of paper into the garbage can. But boy, oh boy, if you look at the arm that they threw it with, the effort that they put in, the delta in their life because they chose to throw and not just give up, that is a, is a test of maybe the person sitting next to the garbage can, right? Gets driven to school every day has two computers because their dad's old one just doesn't, you know, the company gave them a new one. So they got the old one and they have the one that the school gave them, right? All of these things make anything standard absolutely a misnomer. Nothing standard exists in education. So we all have to take the framework of not taking anything personally, not making assumptions, being impeccable with our word and doing our best and assuming that everyone else 
help people to do their best. That's that's what I'm going to say. Help people to do their best. And don't allow there to be energy vampires. Oh my God, it's two o'clock. And German has his hand up. German has his hand up. It's okay, doctor. It's okay. It's okay. Um, but what I really um, but what I really wanted to add is that um um, is that um um, I wanted to add I wanted to add to the comment that um, you mentioned you mentioned something about um um uh, some sort of political issues uh, um um, but if that's happening, well well, you know I watch the news all the time. Um, I watch I, I watch the six o'clock news. I watch the eleven o'clock news. Um, um uh, the prior to uh, the prior to the situations that's going on. Um. All over the world, um, you seen how you seen how some politicians um um argue constantly or or or, or impeccably it, impeccably because um because um um they want to own power, they want to own things, you know what I mean? And I gotta tell you, don't gotta see it que um la situación así ahorita no fue fácil en nuestro país ahorita. You name it, Dominican Republic, Honduras. Honduras, Colombia, things like things of that nature. Though, though um, they do need, they do need educational resources for kids, um, um, um just to pursue, um, just to pursue their goals and, and things like that. Same thing happening over here in in in, in the United States. And I gotta tell you, you te lo dije, doctora. You te lo dije. No, know? I know, I know. I'm gonna put my um email in the chat but also there's a gentleman sitting in this room who has my email and can get you in touch with me anyone who has deeper questions who wants to connect Keisha I would love to connect further there's definitely more that can be discussed Emily go ahead um so I wanted to piggyback right off of the politician thing that was said there's actually a current news uh, situation happening right now in Ecuador, where I'm from, where huh. people have broken inside the news station and it's live and they're shooting and it's actually everywhere. I think it's going to be streamed on uh, the United States uh, reports as well, but it's getting pretty serious. Like I'm watching it live and I'm not going to lie. It's pretty hard to kind of get into it about politicians when it comes to economies that are really low because if i think about dr and if i think about ecuador there's so much that can be done but there's where's the money at really where's there where's the beginning point at really so it's like there's a mumbo jumbo of oh yeah we should give kids the opportunity to have more school stuff have more supplies but then again where do we begin even so it's like it's such a broad thing so i don't know it's yes, just it's absolutely just a really weird situation. There's, but these are these are conversations that as leaders you all need to contribute to these conversations, contribute to the conversation about people voting and the fact that people have a responsibility to vote because so many of the people that we care about don't necessarily have that freedom or right. So we have to take it very seriously if it is part of our right. And if it's not part of our right, we need to educate people who do have that right by staying current and staying, you know, uh, knowing what's going on in the world so that they can make change in a society that is not benefiting everyone. Jason, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, I is the discussion has gotten a little bit more lively in a different direction. I, I know, right? <laughs> I would love to go on. But I want to honor everybody's time, too, because there are some people who have to step out, and we did say 4 o'clock. The first thing I want to say is this should be an example, this experience, of the kind of professor that you should seek out, right? You're you're in your colleges. You're from all over CUNY. Some of you are at Hostos. During the course of your educational life, find the one professor like Christina Marine, Dr. Marine. It will make you... It will make your life so much better. This this experience is a positive experience. Don't get me wrong. But there are other people, brilliant people out there like her. Seek them out because that's what college is about. To have this, this enriching experience, this lively discussion, this really deep connection with somebody 
who is looking after you and providing you with resources that are beneficial to not only you, but to the entire society. Because by giving what Christina has given to you today, you are then going to give that back to others through your actions, through your words, through your ability to use the four agreements or to even deal with the uh, energy vampires that you're going to deal with. So look for professors like uh, Christina. Uh, so many of those professors will love to sit and talk to you because too many of us didn't have professors to go to that were like us. And so we want to pay forward what we believe we needed but never got. And then that's that's what's important is, is you pay it forward. And I, I could say a million other things. But first, I just want to say thank you, Christina. I'm, I mean, you know, I love you. I, I adore you. I, I think the world of you. The, this the experience of knowing you from the moment I met you, experienced you. The I, you were in front of us, so I didn't even meet you. The moment I experienced you till now, it, I don't. There's no words for it. It makes me feel I, something that I want to feel every single day of my life. Because you are that person. Thank you. And I value you. Uh, and I hope that the world and everybody in this room values values you as much as I do. Thank you so for I, all of the comments too in the chat. I really appreciate all of you. If I if I could work anywhere else in the world, it would be the CUNY system. Trust me. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank all of you for being here and for participating and really giving of yourselves and, and sharing and and going through everything with us. I really hope that this is valuable to you. Again, this is recorded. We will share this at the end of, of the experience this week so that you can reflect back on it. You can use it. You can share it with your children, your, your, your friends, so that they also know how to use these skills as well. Uh, but I also want to honor your time. I know it's also crazy out there with the weather and things. So we do have to say goodbye, but we do have some other things coming up. We have a modest change tomorrow morning, but a great speaker nonetheless. Brian Rashid is going to take over for a workshop that, that we have to cancel. Uh, but so we still have the morning workshop tomorrow. My my good friend Tashina Salmon is going to be with us about entrepreneurship next uh, tomorrow afternoon. And then on Thursday, you know, the great uh, Sean Dove um, and, and Joshua Fredenberg in the afternoon. So continue to come. I promise you that the 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 people who are coming are are going to enrich you as as much as Christina has. Although I have to say, I mean this, the work is the work is the work, right? We the theater work that we did was extraordinary. When when Christina came, she, the pictures are in my office. You can come and visit and see them. The people who were in those rooms on those days, I mean, we had a we were there on the day that Haiti had the earthquake, and yep. we stopped all of our work just to have a conversation. That's the kind of professor you want to have in your life. You want to have somebody who's going to stop. They had everything that everything else in the world has to stop because real life happens. And real that's life happens. Yeah. And that's that's what Christina is. So and if you can stay in touch with her, please do do it. Please because do. She she's extraordinary. She just happens to be in Arizona, but that's fine, you know. You visit. also visit. It's really nice here. It's warm. <laughs> Uh, but it's a new world already, so you can always connect with her. Uh, yes. Just don't say LOL a lot. Yeah, exactly. Don't say LOL. <laughs> You're laughing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Arizona Cardinals. Arizona Cardinals. Uh, I, okay. I have to say goodbye to everybody. I want to wish All you right. the rest of the day. Christina, good to see Be you. Be safe, everyone. Be safe. Yeah. Everybody Thank stay you safe. so much. All right. And Thank I will you see so you. much. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Buenas suerte. What a Bye, Good to see you.